Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings here at the U.S. Naval Institute. It is Wednesday, the 10th of April, and we're on the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. I've got a special guest with me today. Our show today is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA certified hub zone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to www.valettaindustries.com. Okay, my guest today is Vice Admiral Angus Topshi, the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy. Admiral, mm. thanks for stopping by. It's a delight. It's a beautiful facility you have here. Uh, it's a great place, and uh, so glad you could be here. From what I understand from your staff, you're starting a massive multi-country trip around the world. Uh, yeah. Where are you going after the United States? So we're off to Singapore, uh, then Brunei, Vietnam, and finally the People's Republic of China for the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. Great, great. Uh, you are what the U.S. Navy would call a surface warfare officer. I am. And you commanded uh, the uh, HMCS Algonquin, a DDG, an Iroquois-class uh, destroyer. Uh, you also served in a number of NATO and NORAD jobs, and you were the uh, Deputy J-5 at U.S. Northern Command. So... A lot of our folks will uh, recognize that as uh, Colorado Springs. Um, and your, I, I loved your bio. Your official bio mentions a lot of sea stories that include pirates, sharks, volcanoes, whales, and fires. So I wanted, wondered if there was a particularly good st sea story that you'd like to lead off with. Uh, well, there's been all sorts of different adventures and things over my time. Uh, I think one of the formative experiences was uh, I was the opso of a frigate. Got called up to the bridge with the captain. We were patrolling the west coast of Vancouver Island. And uh, at the time, there was a killer whale that had become separated from its pod and had become too friendly with ships uh, yeah. and things. And so this was known as Luna. And it had been tormenting an American sailboat um, and had knocked its dinghy free and stuff like that. Captain calls me up to the bridge and says, all right, ops, I'm going to put you in the rib. You need to go over there and fix this situation. And I was like, uh, how do I distract a killer whale? <laughs> in a rib. So, in a rib. So myself and uh, two uh, sailors, we just got down there and just you know, figured it out. How do we attract the whale away to us, knowing we could get away faster the, than the others could? And uh, yep, the, that, the sailboat, though, did not want to hang around. The moment the sort of they were free of the whale, they were gone as quickly as they could be and uh, off. But awesome. so again, did not expect uh, sort of... Um, whale distracting to be in the job description. Yeah. At point. <laughs> I love it. Um, sir, I wanted to talk about uh, a bunch of things that are happening, and some of these are, are topics that are uh, common with the U.S. Navy, other NATO navies, uh, the Canadian Navy. Uh, start with force modernization, and I know you were mm -hmm. here for uh, Sea Air Space, which is a big Navy League event. I, I went to it uh, earlier this week, so a lot of folks, uh, one, showing their wares, uh, and two, a lot of uh, U.S. Navy and Marine Corps leaders talking about force modernization, talking about shipbuilding, et cetera. Uh, and I noticed uh, that the, your Navy has a massive recapitalization program going with like five active shipbuilding programs. Can you describe some of those to us? Yeah, sir. We're in the largest peacetime recapitalization of the Royal Canadian Navy. So uh, we've taken delivery so far of four of what will be six Arctic and offshore patrol vessels. Um, the fifth one will be delivered this year, and the sixth will be launched this year and delivered next year. Really exciting. That's a new capability for our Navy. So they're, they're icebreakers. They go through four feet of ice, um, capable of operating anywhere in the Canadian North in the navigation season and in all of the approaches the rest of the year. Wow. Um, we're also building two new oilers, um, the first one of which is the, the longest ship ever built in Canada. It'll be launched in November of this year. Uh, we'll take delivery next year, and then the follow-on sister ship to that will come uh, just two years later. Longest ship in the ever built in Canada? In Canada, in the, yes. Okay. In Canada. How, how long is this? 173.3 meters, and I'm afraid I can't translate that into uh, imperial 600 off the top of my head. 600 feet-ish, yeah, uh, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm not yeah. terrible with uh, Exactly, that's about that. And yeah. so uh, it's interesting engineering feat because uh, it's longer than the barge that they use to, to launch it. The engineers yeah. all tell me they've worked through this very carefully, um, so I... 
Interesting. I'll be there yeah. for the launching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see how they've resolved and that. Is that what, what is that? Probably a 20, 25,000 ton yeah. ship? Yeah, so uh, 20, uh, just over 20,000 tons based on the Berlin design, uh, Berlin class design from Germany. Okay. Um, and so really exciting. That's the first uh, warship built uh, at the C SPAN yard in Vancouver. Uh, and then uh, the Harry de Wolf class was built in a, a brand new shipyard in Halifax. Once they've finished building our six Arctic and offshore patrol vessels and two more for the Coast Guard, they'll start building the Canadian surface combatant. So that's our destroyer of the future. We're building 15 of them, multi-purpose combatant, uh, classic destroyer, um, optimized for anti-submarine warfare, but air defense, command and control, information warfare, strike, all of the types of things that we need, uh, just over 8,000 tons. Is that... Is that the class of ship that's loosely built on the or the Type Twenty Six? Type Twenty Six. Yeah. So Type Twenty Six for okay. the for the British uh, yep. Hunter class for the Australians. The difference between our navies is that they have um, aircraft carriers and amphibious ships. They have air warfare destroyers. We don't. We've always been a destroyer navy, and so we're going back to our roots. This is our all, all purpose surface combatant. Um, and then going back to your question, as we modernize, the the next thing for us is we're you know the government has told us we're building uh, that I'm um, to come back with options to renew and expand our submarine fleet. So we're looking at eight or twelve conventionally powered diesel electric submarines. Um, and you have four now. We have four right now. Right. And they're um, being recapitalized? Or? So, yeah, so the four that we have were designed to preserve the ability to operate submarines in Canada. It was never okay. representative of the true capability we required. Um, so now we're going to invest in that capability uh, to make sure we get submarines that, that will really defend Canadian waters and contribute where appropriate abroad. Are you looking at domestically producing those submarines? or? Uh, so our shipbuilding industry, so we've rebuilt the shipbuilding industry under the National Shipbuilding Strategy. This is about a uh, I think it's now about 12 year commitment from government to really invest in sovereign shipbuilding capability in Canada. We've pretty much maxed out our capacity in Canada between the renewal of the Coast Guard fleet and the Navy. Um, and even if we were to build the upper end of the submarine requirement in Canada, we'd never get to enough to sustain a submarine building enterprise. Got it. So our intention is a military off the shelf yep. and a true military off the shelf. So ideally we would go to another country, partner with that country and their uh, equipment manufacturer and buy it as it is. Um, because I don't want to get in design spirals. I need a submarine and I need it as quickly as possible. So um, we're exploring options to get that done uh, quite quickly. Can you say who's bidding for that business? So the six countries that have um, a submarine or a design that would be suitable for our requirements are Japan and Korea, which both have boats in service right now. Yep. Spain, which has uh, a boat that is in sea trials. And then there are three others that have designs. So the French, uh, their design just won the competition uh, with the Dutch Navy, whose requirements are very similar to ours. There's also Sweden, uh, which has a variation of their uh, A26. And finally, Germany, who's partnered with Norway to build a Type 212 mm. common design. There's an extended version of that that would be suitable for our requirements. So. Any of them with an AIP capability? Are you so, looking at that? So a mix of capabilities. So some AIP, some actually battery technology is at the point now where we can meet the indiscretion requirements probably without needing to go AIP. Got it. That's great. That is that is a massive recapitalization. How, uh, just a follow-on question, because it is uh, it's echoed throughout the Navy news in our country right now, is limitations of the industrial base. Are mm -hmm. you, uh, have, has that commitment, that 12-year commitment that you spoke of, has that gotten you through that? Or, or are you still feeling those sorts of limitations that, that our Navy is very much feeling right now? So I think, I mean, the challenge is when you build a shipyard to build a ship, um, you know you're going to have some challenges. And so um, the Irving Yard in Halifax went through some, some growing pains. Um, you know, the delivery of the first of the Harry DeWolf class had some, had some challenges. Um, the good news is we've worked through all of those and, and the challenges you expect with any first of class design. Sure. Um, what we've seen is a significant improvement in their ability. And so they're delivering um, ships five and six ahead of schedule, well ahead of the revised schedule that sort of came with, okay, we're getting better, we can do it faster. They're doing it even faster than those uh, increased schedule. Seeing the same thing uh, on the West Coast at the C-SPAN yard in Vancouver, they, you know, the improvement from ship to ship has been remarkable. What's even more impressive in that yard is they've never built more than three of any platform. And so mm -hmm. it's a shipyard that's been very agile. They built three offshore fisheries and science vessels. Then they transitioned to build the first of the joint support ships. The in between there's an offshore oceanographic and science vessel for the Coast Guard. Then they're building the second joint support ship for the Navy. And then they're building our polar icebreaker. And so wow. this yard has been going all over the map. And we're seeing yeah. uh, tremendous improvements in the, the quality of their construction as they go through. Um, so we really have realized the problem of building a sovereign shipbuilding capability in Canada. Now, 
I always want it to be faster sure. <laughs> so, yeah. and cheaper uh, right. would be nice. Um, but we're, we're comfortable with where we're at. I had a, a conversation, um, you know, around some of the challenges in shipbuilding and making sure the design um, is ready to go. Uh, and we've been really holding the, you know, uh, the consortium that's building it to account to make sure that they've done all of the difficult work. We're seeing really positive signs of progress. We've had some blips. We've had to, you know, go from, they said it was 65% complete. We found out, well, that actually meant it was around 50% complete, but now we're trending back up. We've got, got the design into the 80% completion. Um, we're really looking good and we're doing a zone, a zone construction approach. And so it's going to be, um, we don't have to have the entire ship design finalized as long as we know that this compartment can be locked down and finalized. And so we're excited by the prospect of cutting steel on the first of the class uh, next year. Wow, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about current operations. So everyone is watching the news of what's happening in the Red Sea, Operation Prosperity Guardian, which is a multinational effort to protect maritime shipping over there in the Red Sea from the Houthi attacks. Um, can you describe what Canada's contribution has been so far, and do you see it staying steady or increasing? What's what's happening with your Navy's yeah. contribution? So specific to Prosperity Guardian, we've contributed uh, three staff officers as part of the watch, uh, both at sea and uh, ashore. Um, that's unique to Prosperity Guardian. There are around 300 Canadians across uh, all of our services, so soldiers, sailors, aviators, and operators in the Middle East doing a variety of different functions. Part of the Canadian contribution right now is we're commanding uh, Combined Task Force 150 Got it. Um, in the 5th Fleet AOR, um, what we call Operation Artemis. So we've got a fairly significant presence in the region. As far as Prosperity Guardian goes itself, we considered the option of deploying a ship, but we're at the uh, size of our fleet right now is 12 frigates. And we deploy four of those a year, and so to deploy one to Prosperity Garden specifically would have taken away from what we consider to be the more important theater in Indo-Pacific okay. uh, and our ongoing NATO commitments uh, through what we call op reassurance. And so that's why we've chosen to contribute staff, but we're still uh, heavily involved in the region. And of course, we share an interest in making sure that you know ships can transit freely and safely through the Red Sea. Um, so that is a priority for Canada and something that we work in cooperation with allies to achieve. So you have a ship over there or just a staff that's commanding CTF-150? Just a staff ashore at this point. Okay. Um, so we will be sending um, a ship through the region on its way to um, deploy into the Indo-Pacific. Um, so if necessary, that ship could be retasked to assist and to contribute. But uh, the plan okay. right now is for it to focus on the So Indo that'll Pacific. be an East Coast ship? That's right, okay. yeah. Yes, this is a, a whole of Navy effort to uh, to get into the Indo-Pacific. And so, interestingly, when I, my first operational deployment and when I joined the Navy, I was based on the West Coast. I went through the Panama Canal and deployed to, on a NATO mission because mm -hmm. the priority effort at the time was NATO. Things have now flipped. We're seeing sailors from the East Coast going to the Indo-Pacific for the first time uh, in their careers. It's an exciting time for all of them. They're seeing new ports, new places. Yep. You know, the experience of going through the, the Panama Canal uh, is a pretty unique one. Uh, so they're really enjoying that. and. Uh, we may even look at them doing round the world cruises, uh, so because they do go through the Suez Canal. If I had my way, you know, sailor experience, they've they've gone all the way all that time. It would be great if they could finish it by doing the full circumnavigation of the world, which we've done a couple of times in our career yeah. as we've deployed on missions around the world. That's exciting. Uh, it also means you've got to prepare your crews for, you know, every area of responsibility, every part. You know, you got to think That's about right. what what's happening in the Atlantic, what's happening in the Mediterranean, in the the fifth fleet area, our fifth yeah. fleet area of our, you know, the AOR, then the Indian Ocean, the Pacific. It's it's challenging, it's yeah, because the communications and, and cryptography requirements change in each of those regions, and right. so making sure that we've got all the systems that are required on board. But that's been something that in Canada we've always made a point of. Uh, it's a priority for us to be able to integrate into whatever force makes the most sense. And like I said, we're a small navy. I mean, it's twelve frigates uh, and you know, soon to be six of the Arctic and offshore patrol ships, and just twelve coastal defense vessels to go with our four subs. But we operate globally. Um, there's nowhere we won't go, um, and we need to be effective and relevant when we get there. Logistically, for an Atlantic uh, ship to go around and, and operate in the Indo-Pacific, are you replenishing that ship in port in, in foreign countries, or are you working with another, with a, you know, perhaps with the U.S. strike group or logistics support? How do you 
how do you maintain and support that ship as she deploys? So we always look for opportunities because the, the least productive time for a ship is when it's just doing an independent steaming exercise, sailing on its own across a vast ocean sure. expanse. Um, and so wherever we can, we align with other nations, join in on uh, deployments to, to partner up for a period of time. Um, we have an interim replenishment capability, a leased ship uh, known as uh, the motor vessel Asterix. And so when Montreal did its first deployment in the Indo Indo-Pacific from the East Coast, it, Asterix went along with it. Then it stayed in the Pacific um, yeah. this year, and so it'll be part of uh, our contribution to RIMPAC this year. Got it. Um, because, you know, recognizing the vast distances in the Pacific, our replenishment capacity is, is better suited there. So, yeah, if, if there's nothing else, we'll go and we'll pull into port, refuel there. Um, but this is the real advantage of being part of a vast network of allies and partners is that there's so many different options for us to find fuel, to find supplies along the way, and at the same time build our skills. That's great. Um, preview of coming attraction for Proceedings readers and, and uh, our listeners. The May issue of the magazine, which is our International Navy's focused issue, uh, is coming up. We're getting ready to send that to the press next week. Uh, we always reach out to the International Navy commanders around the world, uh, and thank you for responding. But we, we send a question, usually around the first of the year, to all the International Navy CNOs through their uh, attaches here in Washington. And we ask a question that we're curious, how, how is your Navy or Coast Guard uh, managing this problem? This year's problem was about, or question was about, uh, manning, root, recruiting, retention, because it is a vexing problem for the U.S. Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard right now. Uh, so we asked all the International Navy Chiefs how you're dealing with recruiting and retention. Yeah. And so you gave us a great answer, yeah. which we'll, I just read through it and uh, helped edit it yesterday. Um, but talk about that a little bit. How is the, the Royal Canadian Navy dealing with recruiting and retention in 2023, 2024? Yeah, it's a challenging space. Um, unemployment is at pretty much an all-time low in Canada right now, and so it's a very competitive job market. Most Canadians um, don't ever give the Navy any thought, and mm -hmm. we see across the marine sector actually real challenges in our shipyards as well to recruit the talent that we need. Um, so to break through in all of that environment, we introduced a Naval Experience Program. So this is a what I'm calling a sort of internship, a one-year program. So it's a, just a one-year commitment. Uh, you join as a generic sailor, so you're not assigned to specific occupation. Do the common basic training that everybody gets, some Navy-specific training. That takes up about three months, and then they spend the next nine months experiencing everything the Navy has to offer. Every job uh, in the Navy, they'll be assigned to both Halifax and Victoria so that they see both coasts. Oh, in one year they, in one year, they spend yes. time in both coasts? Both coasts. They still get four weeks of vacation time, as wow. I point out to all of the parents considering letting their kids go, and we'll okay. even fly them home to, to see family at some point yeah. and all of that. And they will get a, an opportunity to go on one of our ships, ideally while it's deployed on international operations, so that they get, again, join the Navy, see the world. We're trying to make that real for all of them. Yeah. Um, the program's only been going for about a year. We targeted, you know, remembering we're a small Navy, we targeted about 144 people for the first year. Okay. With a month left to go, we were at 160. Um, and more importantly for me, I'm seeing the number of people who walk into a recruiting center and express a desire to join the Canadian Navy has tripled. Um, we're seeing a, a tripling of the number of visible minorities and Indigenous Canadians who are joining the Navy as well through this program. We're seeing the same sort of rates of women joining through this program. So we're, we're tapping into the, uh, what seems to be a new demographic uh, capacity that hadn't been considering the Navy before. So the challenge now is that we've got to take these sailors who've signed up for 365 days and convert them to career sailors. Um, the first of them are at the, at the point where they're making those decisions, and the first the early indications are very positive. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I was, and I'm, I'm going to, I won't say which country I think it is, because one of the other countries, there, I think we have 26 countries that uh, answered the question this year, and one of the European countries had a similar program uh, to yours, um, yeah. a one-year um, you know, opportunity to come in, serve, see the Navy, see whether it's what you want rather than signing up for a four-year stint. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's a pretty creative way to go about. Yeah. You know. The other advantage of the program for me is that uh, I got permission to allow my Naval Reserve to recruit into the regular force. Ah. So that uh, doubled the capacity of recruiters because there's 24 recruiting centers for the Canadian Armed Forces across Canada. I now have 24 Naval Reserve divisions that are also working hard to attract the best and brightest uh, Canadians into the Navy. Um, and, you know, giving reservists a mission that matters like that has really attracted a lot of attention and effort on their part. And so we're seeing that pay off. That's great. Um, the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps have talked about for the last couple of years making it easier to go from the active 
component to the reserve component and back again. Is that something that your Navy's doing? Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to working really hard for what we call a, that component transfer. Um, I control it if they go into the Navy from the reserve force to the regular force, and so we're working to, to expedite that process. And one of the commitments is the moment they sort of say, hey, you know what, I want to go on to full-time service, then we'll, we'll employ them full-time while we process the paperwork and start to get the benefit of them. So they see the immediate return in terms of, you know, a, a steady wages for the full-time as opposed to the part-time. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, let's talk about NATO for a minute. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on with NATO. Another preview of coming attractions in the May issue uh, one of our perennial authors, a guy named Eric Wertheim, who writes our Combat Fleets uh, uh, column every month, we've asked him for the last couple of years, and he's done it again this year, to look at NATO navies and just summarize what are some of the major things that are, are happening, either organizationally or uh, shipbuilding capacity types of things. Um, and uh, so er that's where I got mm -hmm. some, of, some of the <laughs> questions or some of the, the data points on your shipbuilding uh, uh, programs for the, the Canadian Navy. Uh, as a Navy chief looking at your NATO allies, right, mm. what, what, what excites you um, and with changes in both the threat picture, so obviously NATO now very much reoriented and worried mm -hmm. about Russia uh, and the Arctic and with the addition of Sweden and Finland, um, how is that changing the calculus, the thinking about um, how you work together as a team, perhaps even how you specialize and let some navies focus on certain parts of a mission versus everybody being a generalist. You know, what, what are yeah. some of the thoughts at, at your level and with your counterparts in other NATO navies? Yeah, so I think what excites me the most about NATO right now is that we've really gotten serious about uh, how do we achieve deterrence. It's one thing to say that, you know, an alliance of 32 deters Russia. Right. It's another thing to make sure that that's tangible and meaningful and adopting a campaigning mindset. So really impressed with the work that MARCOM HQ has done under Admiral Atlee to, to make that meaningful and to make sure that whatever we do is done with thoughtful uh, intention. Um, so for us, you know, we're excited to take command of Standing NATO Maritime Group 2 uh, this summer. So we'll command that through the fall. Um, so that's the sort of more robust surface combatant group. We also contribute uh, two mine hunters to the mine countermeasures group uh, every year. And that's an opportunity for us to see exactly as you say, where should we be specializing in our efforts? So we've got some fantastic clearance divers. We've got great offboard capabilities uh, from Canadian industry. So we work with our partners to make sure we understand all of that. We know that whenever the war in Ukraine ends, there'll be a tremendous amount of work to clear mm -hmm. the Black Sea of mines. Sure. Um, so we're ready for that mission and we're ready for whatever else happens because you know, what happens under the water and on the seabed increasingly matters as well. And so I find that, you know, I'm seeing in NATO navies a real interest in making sure that we've got the right capabilities. Um, and the challenge there is it's good to have a niche capability, but you still have to have some basic capabilities too. And I think, and that sovereign capability. And so for us, again, in the Canadian Navy, it's a real focus on our roots, anti-submarine warfare. We need to be among the world's best at, at making sure we can do theater ASW, that we can keep submarines far away from North America, that we can secure the ocean approaches in the Atlantic and in the Pacific and, and in the Arctic if and where necessary. Um, and so that's what we're focused on specializing in that way. And we're seeing other navies increasingly paying attention to the areas of warfare that really matter. You, you mentioned uh, ASW, and I, I forgot to mention in your capital, recapitalization effort, uh, 16, I think, uh, P-8s mm -hmm. that uh, your Navy, have you procured all of them or some of them? Where are you in that, in that program? So fascinating thing about the Royal Canadian Navy, in every other naval service, that this would be the fleet air arm, uh, would belong yep. to me, but the P-8s belong to my friend, <laughs> the Air Force. General Kenny, okay. commander of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Got it. Um, but of course, I track that project quite closely. So we've, we've got a great capability right now in the CP-140 Aurora, which is a P-3 derivative. Yep. The Block 4 mission set is fantastic. The challenge is the planes are getting old and the countermeasures and defensive suites weren't up to the current standard. So we seized the opportunity to buy the, in the P-8 as the line starts to shut down. Um, we'll be taking delivery of those in 2026. So it's a very okay. rapid transition First that's happening right now. First coming on in 26. Yeah, gotcha. and so there's a lot of effort on the Air Force right now to make sure that that's meaningful. Um, we've already got air crew training with the U.S. right now, again, benefiting from that network of partners and allies around the world as we, we, we share common interests. Yeah. And often we can leverage each other for training, for support, for sustainment, um, and, and certainly taking full will, advantage. Will those aircraft be focused, will it be an even split between East Coast, West Coast, uh, yeah. Atlantic, Pacific kind of thing? Yeah, so pretty much along the same lines is my understanding. I think the Air Force is still refining exactly where they'll deploy the numbers. Um, but yes, so Greenwood is the East Coast base, Comox is the West Coast base. 
making sure we can cover both coasts. But one again, the great advantage of a P8 is it's really easy to deploy it from coast to coast whenever yeah. we need to. Right, right, great. Um, let's talk about the Arctic for a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. Uh, so this, in, in our pages, in proceedings over the last few years, there's been uh, numerous articles about the fact that the Arctic is opening up, it's becoming open water, longer periods of the year, there's more uh, shipment, both commercial, there's, there's cruise ships up in the Arctic now. Um, there's, uh, you know, traffic going from, uh, you know, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. It's a shorter route. Um, resource extraction. The Chinese have declared themselves a near Arctic nation mm -hmm. uh, with two, uh, you know, serious icebreakers that they have. Uh, so how, how is Canada looking at the security situation uh, in the Arctic? Um, it sounds like, you know, you mentioned those uh, offshore, you know, Arctic patrol vessels. So that's, you're mm -hmm. taking it very seriously. Um, what excites you about the Arctic mission and, uh, you know, maybe what, what keeps you, what, what are your keeps concerns? You right? yeah. What keeps you awake? Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, we are delighted to have the Arctic and offshore patrol vessels. It's a really timely capability for us. Uh, the last time the Canadian Navy had an icebreaker was 1954. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So the last time the Canadian Navy had an icebreaker yeah. was 1954. That's right. So is that primarily been a, a Coast Guard? A Coast Guard mission. Asset. Yeah. Okay. So it had always been that if it was breaking ice, it was Coast Guard. Yeah. Because to be honest, our, we looked at that and said, yeah, well, where there's ice, there's not really a security threat most of the time. There you go. Yeah. That has changed. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be able to make sure that when the Canadian Navy needs to be there, that we can be there. And so the, the Harry to Wolf class does that for us. Um, really impressed, actually, with the capabilities of that class. It has exceeded our expectations for what it can do. Um, and, you know, so in 2021, we had Harry DeWolf go through the Northwest Passage and circumnavigate all of North America, proving it's ready to operate in every environment around the continent. Um, as we become more comfortable in uh, operating those ships up in the high north, we're continuing to make connections with the communities of the north. And really for us, it's a whole of society effort uh, because it's not just about what government brings, it's also about how do we link in with territorial governments, how do we link in with the communities, uh, the indigenous people of the north, how do we work with industry? Because infrastructure in the north is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And why would I try and build a facility if industry has one already and we can work together and I can make sure that they're compensated for any use that we might make of that facility? Um, and we're exploring all sorts of partnerships like that. Yeah, that uh, makes can, sense. Yeah. Are you seeing um, different behaviors from the Russians in the Arctic <laughs> over the last couple of years? Um, so, you I mean, with, certainly there's a massive construction program of recapitalizing a lot of Russia's defensive architecture up in the north. Um, Admiral Perry and I were on a panel, that's the second fleet commander the other day, and I think we share the opinion that, you know, we're watching with interest what Russia's doing up there, but you can understand why, given that over 20% of Russia's GDP is in their Arctic region, why they would build a robust network to make sure they can defend that. Right. Now, that can also be a base for offensive operations, so we keep a close eye on what do we think their intent is, and obviously with Ukraine, there's some concerning indicators there. Uh, but by and large, I can understand and explain what Russia's doing there. Yeah. China's activity in the Arctic is a bit of a different thing. Um, declaring themselves a near-Arctic nation, as you pointed out, indicates a desire to be in the region. Um, we're watching with interest what they do. You know, there's way long one and two have been through Canadian waters. They're very careful to ask our permission before they do all of that stuff, uh, as they're required. You know, if you're doing scientific research within an exclusive economic zone, yep. requires a country's permission, and so they, they do that. But they spend a lot of time outside of that. It, it seems clear to me that they're exploring routes across the Arctic as the ice retreats. What would they be doing? Um, and my concern is resource exploitation up there, specifically I, I fish that. and other protein resources of yeah. the sea. Um, there's a moratorium against that right now in the high seas areas. But I, I can't help but feel that that moratorium has more to do with the fact that at the time it was agreed, no one could go there and no one needed to go there because there weren't any fish. Now the fish are starting to go there and the ice is starting to go away. Yep. Um, so that is an area we're watching with, with great interest. And we make sure that whenever there's any activity in our north, uh, we're watching it very carefully. And if you saw, the government on Monday just released a new defense policy update for Canada. Very strong Arctic commitment. In fact, it's called Our North Strong and Free. Um, I have very clear marching orders from government that I'm to invest in all of the sensors that I need to detect uh, and you know, track any threat, uh, to potential threat to Canada on the seas or under the seas uh, in the Arctic approaches. I mentioned already we've been told to explore options and to present options to government for a submarine fleet that very deliberately will be able to operate in those Arctic approaches. Um, so, yeah, no, we're concerned, but we're putting our money um, behind building the robust capabilities. 
So, so far, it sounded like uh, it, the Chinese fishing fleet has not gone no. up, up into the Arctic and started to exploit fish. Okay. Yeah. Well, like yeah. I said, yeah. it's not, yeah. So right now there's an agreement that we're not, no one should be doing that, but uh, how long that lasts? Because as with all international law, it really is a, it's, it's a global consensus. There's no, there's no world policeman to, to enforce the rules. It's right. a, it comes down to sort of uh, nations working together to agree that, you know, we put these rules in place for a reason. It's in our interest to make sure we follow yeah. them. We, we often hear from uh, foreign Navy chiefs uh, when we ask them more general questions each year about, you know, the, the, the biggest maritime security dilemmas or problems mm -hmm. that they face. From a lot of countries, we hear IUU fishing. We hear the Chinese you know, fishing fleet encroaching in their EEZ and, and fishing in their EEZ. Uh, we hear from our Coast Guard that that is a, a huge and growing mission area. So yeah. I'm glad to hear that the Chinese fishing fleet hasn't gone above the Bering, the Bering Strait yet. Yet. Yeah, and but it's interesting. So the government released an Indo-Pacific strategy a couple of years ago, and uh, it caught a lot of attention because, among other things, it was uh, unusually specific, and it told me to deploy three frigates a year into Indo-Pacific as a clear sign of our commitment. Um, but it was also funded, and part of that funding uh, came down to not just increased naval and Canadian Armed Forces presence, but increased presence in terms of fisheries operations. Mm -hmm. And so our Department of Fisheries and Oceans has conducted a couple of fisheries enforcement missions out there. Always challenging on the high seas because you, you can watch a Chinese ship uh, do shark finning, you know, so illegal and uh, you know, just unsustainable exploitation of a resource. Yeah. So they hand over all the documentation, but it goes to the Chinese Coast Guard. And then uh -huh. we have to ask ourselves, okay, right. you know, do, hopefully something's been done. Yeah. You know, we, you know we, we would expect that, you know, they would take care of stuff like that uh, right. and make sure that their fisher, fishers comply with the law, but um, we never really know. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, sir, we are about out of time, so mm -hmm. I'll give the last question to you. Is there any, mm -hmm. any questions I should have asked you, or do you have any saved rounds? I think the only thing I'd say is that uh, it's always great to be down into the, to the United States, had the opportunity to attend Sea Air Space, to see the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, to realize just, you know, it's such a, a powerful thing to be a part of a, a group of allies like this, and our, our closest partner is the U.S. And so for your audience, the one thing I want to say is, like, Canada is there. We are absolutely committed to making sure that North America is secure from whatever threats may come in this dangerous world at this moment, and uh, couldn't have a better partner to do it with. Well, I'd say uh, on, on behalf of our readers and listeners, uh, you know, thank you for having our northern flank or front or whatever <laughs> you want to call it uh, and for being great partners. And I, I really am impressed by the recapitalization that your Navy is doing when I read about it. And, I, and I'll, I'll uh, highlight it for our readers when the May issue comes, you know, read through. Uh, some of that information about, and we've also had uh, a, a combat fleets on the DeWolf class, mm -hmm. um, and we'll do a video on that that class of ships, mm -hmm. those offshore patrol vessels. They're very impressive ships, mm -hmm. and as you said, four four feet of ice. Yeah, that that's serious ice breaking. It is. Yeah, and for some reason we were hesitant to call them icebreakers initially, and I right. got in, I was like, no, no, uh, four feet of ice is is breaking ice. Let's call them icebreakers. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Well, my guest has been Vice Admiral Angus Topshi, the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy. Sir, thanks for stopping by. Uh, it's great to have you. Great to meet you. And uh, on behalf of the Naval Institute, I want to thank you with a, a gift. Uh, this is a new book come out just come out a couple months ago from the uh, Naval Institute Press. It is called The Neptune Factor, Alfred Thayer Mahan and the Concept of Sea Power by Nick Lambert. Awesome. Well, I've got a couple of flights coming up where this will be very handy. <laughs> it's a great book. It's thanks a great very much. Book. Thank you very much. That concludes another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.